preparation? How do you get prepared for your breakthrough? How do you get ready for the thing that God's already withheld nothing? He's already got it laid up for you. But how do you prepare yourself to receive it with everything? And I shared a couple of principles. Um, we, we talked about Luke 18 and 1, which I'll get to read here in a second. And uh, we talked about the notion of a parable, which is Luke 18 is a parable. A parable is the purpose for teaching and instruction. It's, it's to give you a sense of what God's saying without necessarily coming right in front with it, but it's giving you some insights. Jesus used a lot of parables to teach people of the day. We use parables for teachings of today as well. So we can again begin with Luke 18, 1 through 8, and then I'll continue with kind of a brief recap, and then we'll continue our message as we get prepared for breakthrough. This is a big deal because everybody wants a breakthrough, but nobody wants to go through the process of getting it, though. It don't work that way. So I want to get you ready for the process of receiving what he's already provided. But sometimes we've got to go through some things. Some things we can go to, but some things we've got to go through. And I'm going to teach you how to go through some things. So let's start with Luke 18, verses 1 through 8, which we read last week, and we'll do it again. It says this, starting in verse 1. And again, as I said, a parable is for teaching and instruction. And this is one of the unique parables where he tells you right what this parable is about in verse 1. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always what? And not... Give up. Pray and not give up. Pray and not give up. Verse 2. He said, Jesus being, in a certain town there was a judge. There was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused. But finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God, or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me. This is Ken Howard's version. Day in and day out, she keeps coming. She's getting on my last nerve, but she keeps coming. I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. Now, real quick, that notion of eventually come and attack me doesn't necessarily mean she's going to throw hands on him and, you know, give him some jujitsu. That word come and attack me is translated as give me a black eye. Not necessarily from a punch, but she's going to wear me out. She's giving me a black eye. She's staining me. She's just, just, I just can't deal with her. And then it goes on to say in verse 6, And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says, and will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him every day and night? Will he keep putting them off? Question mark. Now, as I said too last week, don't conflate this judge, this unjust judge with our just God. It's a comparison, but also it's a contrast. Um, this ju- unjust judge gave this lady justice because she just, he just wanted her to go away. Our God does not operate with us that way. And also what I talked about last week, there's the three characters. There's the widow, who's the person that is the, the, the central point of this story, who keeps coming and coming and coming. We know that she's lost her husband. We don't know her name. We know the second character is the judge who is called and described as being unjust judge, which means he has no fear of people. He has no fear of man. It, there's probably a sense that maybe this judge maybe takes some bribes every now and then just because he's unjust, right? And then there's the third character. Who's the third character, do you remember? The adversary. The adversary is the one that prompted the widow to come to the judge in the first place. The adversary that looms at us and tries to provoke us with problems and situations. So the adversary, even though they have a silent part, they have an insignificant part because they are the impetus and why the widow is grieved, why the widow is frustrated, and she takes her problems to the judge. Before you reach your breakthrough, some of the points I mentioned last week is you're going to have a problem. You can't break through some of everything's hunky-dory and easy. There's nothing to break through because you're already there. But a problem will always precede your breakthrough. Some issue, some instance, something that's going to cause you some disruption, some uncomfort, some unease. There's always a problem. This widow had a problem that she took it to the judge from the adversary. She was in a hard season, as they said. The other point I mentioned besides problem just uh, last week was also pray. This parable doesn't say that the, woman, the widow was a prayer, but it says that she brought her petitions. Prayer is a form of petitioning God what you need. And I said also last week that there's a difference between telling and asking. We ask God. We don't tell God nothing. 
but, but maybe tell him you are great, you are glorious, you are amazing. We tell him that, but we don't tell him to do anything. We ask, Lord, thank you. We I ask you, Lord, according to thy will, we ask God with our request. This widow took her request, told the judge what she needed, and kept coming. And the last thing I said last week was patience. In a season of breakthrough, you're going to need some patience. You're going to need to wait some things out. And when you think things are not working out, the most is when they tend to happen and manifest. But you can't let a delay in your blessing stop you from doing what you know you need to do. Many of us quit before the blessing happens because we think, oh, it's nothing's working. There's nothing that's happening. I'm, I, we, we, can't, we can't wait to wait. Patience is a, a, a major key in the process and the walk with God in developing your faith. God will make you wait. When you think you can't wait no more, he's going to make you wait a little bit longer. Right when you think, I can't, Lord, I can't, uh, no, keep waiting, keep waiting. One of the things, my, my lovely wife is a great uh, cook. And I remember, I know Thanksgiving, she does a lot of things with macaroni. And sometimes when she puts the macaroni in, it looks like it's done on the edges because it's got a little brown crispiness, which I like. But sometimes I say, hey, baby, let's take it out. It looks, it looks done for me. I look it in the oven. It looks well. It looks done. She said, oh, no, 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 no. Not done on the inside. See, some of us see blessings for the outside, but God says, no, you're not ready on the inside yet. You're still a little doughy in the inside. You need a little bit more bacon to do before it's ready to be served. But in our eyes, we think, no, 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 it looks good. We go by what we see. He goes by what he knows. So you got to be patient. Patient is imperative. So with that being said, I want to continue today with two points in this process of preparing for breakthrough. And the point I want to make to you now is, as you get ready for this breakthrough, it, the thing that I saw in verse 4 that was touching to me was, it says, for some time the judge refused, but he finally said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see she gets justice. Because she keeps bothering me is the term he used. But the term I'm going to use is not bother, but perseverance. In this season, before you get your breakthrough, you're going to have to have some perseverance in your life. See, when the judge expected the widow to give up, she came up. She kept coming. He kept avoiding her, but she kept coming. I think sometimes as Christians, we think just because we are who we are, that things just happen without any effort or work. It didn't work that way. We live in a culture where everybody kind of names it and claims it, and then they walk away and don't do nothing, expect God to do something with it. And then we wonder why the people that are, are worldly, that don't believe in God, get all the blessings. Let me tell you, perseverance works for the just and the unjust. It works for the Christian and the non-Christian. If you persevere, you will work through what you've got to work through. It will come to you. As Christians, we've got to toughen up. We've got to start toughening up. We, 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 get too, um, 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 we get too cowardly on things. We, we just want to give up. Sometimes Christians, we just, oh, no, I can't take it anymore. Uh, because I'm a, I'm, his, uh, I'm a Christian and I'm a son, why am I suffering? Because you are a Christian, that's why you're suffering. Because he knows you can handle it. If, listen to this. If Jesus has to suffer, if Jesus had to take his cross, who are you and I to avoid any of that? Jesus was the blueprint for how we're supposed to, and we're supposed to be more like him. That comes not only with his glory, but it comes with his sufferings too. But the thing is, when you and I suffer, we don't suffer just for the sake of suffering. We suffer because there's a bigger end in sight. We suffer because he's doing something on the inside. He's making us bake on the inside. There's a reason. He doesn't make you suffer just for the sake of he's laughing at you. Like, oh, let me see how they deal with that. Look no further than the evidence of Job. Take my servant Job. I always envisioned when I saw when I read about Job and how God voluntold Job is going to be the one that Satan's going to attack. But I always envisioned in my mind when, when God had that conversation with the devil that he was like you boast with your child that you that you know, got that, got all A's, or they did something good, they scored that basketball goal. Said, that's my son right there. He's the one that scored that goal. Yeah, that's, that's, this is my boy. I think that he boasted on Joe because he knew what was on the inside. The devil didn't. I always said it was a sucker's bet on the devil. How does the devil make a bet with God who knows the end from the beginning? It was a sucker's bet, and the devil was the sucker. He's betting against you, but the devil's a sucker. You have on the inside everything that you need because you got God on the inside. He knows what you're made of. He's the cook. He made you with all the ingredients. The devil only sees what he thinks he knows, but it's not everything. He knows what's on the inside. But when he chooses us for the time for struggle because he thinks and knows, you can handle it. The question is, 
question is, do you know that? Perseverance will bring out some stuff in you that you didn't know that you had. Sometimes you don't know the things that you can endure until you endure them. It's one thing for me to read this book from front to cover, but if I don't live it out, it means nothing. That's how God knows what's on the inside. Well, excuse me, God knows what's on the inside. That's how you and I know. When we get squeezed, the thing that's on the inside that's always been there, it has a way of coming out. And then you know what he already knows. Oh, I got through that season. That's what God does with perseverance. Perseverance is a gift. Because persistence is the choice of, to continue to do something despite the obstacles and the challenges. See, what that means is you're going to have obstacles and you're going to have challenges, but the question is, are they going to stop you from doing what you know you need to do? It's easy to give up. It's easy to say, nope, no moss, I'm tapping out. Deuces, I'm out of here. That's easy. It's hard getting back up again, even though you know you might get smacked down, but you pop up, that's hard to do. But you are equipped and you are made. You're fearlessly made to be able to endure it. Nothing in this world can take the place of persistence and perseverance. There's no book you're going to read. There's nothing that, there's no shortcut to that situation. You've got to go through it. You've got to go through it. See, when you're persistent and when you fail, when you fail, it's an event. Meaning it happened and I failed. The difference between being an event and being a failure is when you fail and you keep thinking that I'm a failure, I'm going to fail. Okay, I'm a failure in life. I can't do this. I can't do that. I can't seem to make this happen because I keep failing. That's a mindset. We're all going to fail. But let me tell you, when you fail, you don't lose. You, you learn. If you know that I, I didn't do something right, if I can retool myself and come back again, I have an, a better chance if I'm persevere to get through that thing that's trying to stop me back. But if you're a failure, that means you fail, that means you quit. And the next time you see that same thing, you quit again before you even get a chance to start. God is, there's no failure in God. There's no failure in you. If you've got Jesus in your heart, there is no failure in you. He's equipped you. You've got God's DNA on the inside of you. There's no quit in you. But the enemy is trying to make you quit because he knows. If, he, if they learn this perseverance thing, ain't nothing I can do with somebody who's perseverance. Who has perseverance is persistence. The widow, and there's no connection that this widow is, is, is a Christian or anything. It just says she was persistent, and she got justice from an unjust person. So she's persistent because she keeps coming. She keeps coming. She keeps coming. See, every failure is an opportunity to learn. But it also allows you to overcome challenges. And that's why God puts those things in our pathway so we can learn from them. He's not putting the problem just to make you dis, uh, disgruntled and uncomfortable. And for no, Again, you're learning. It's building your strength. And it's then and it's only then that your strength and endurance is built up in your faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence things, of things unseen. Failure is evidence of things unseen and seen. But you've got to go through those times to build up your faith for the next obstacle. And your persistence creates the break forth in order for you to break through. But you've got to build up strength to that. You've got to build up your resistance, your tolerance. You've got to build up your faith. There's no better time to build up faith when you ain't seen nothing working. This is all you've got to rely on. Lord, here's your word. I don't see any indication that anything's about to happen, but I trust you anyways. That's persistence. That's persistence. And that's the persistence he's looking for in this season of breakthrough to make sure you can handle it. I love Matthew 7, 7 and 8, which we read last week. If we can bring that up, please. It's what I call the ask. I had a message years ago called the ask principle. And it simply says, ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. Knock. And the door will be open to you. That's a principle, but it's also a formula for success. It starts with asking. Many times in our lives, we're asking God, Lord, I need you. I, I know this is something that's going to ride in my life, but I need you. Now, mind you, this is concrete. <laughs> and that's the person my nephew brought in. It's, it's, it's fairly heavy. It's a weight. But think of this concrete as any problem in your life right now that seems to be immovable, seems to be solid, seems to be something that just, just can't get out your way. The way that Christians, we attack it is we, we keep praying. 
may not see it splintering or anything, but we keep petitioning. We keep asking, Lord, I need breakthrough in this situation. I know I see this, this concrete. I can't see through it, but it's solid. It's not moving. It is heavy. Your position is to ask. No matter what's going around, I don't see it cracking. I'm still asking. And then when you get done asking, I'm going to start seeking. Lord, I seek your face. I need some insight and some wisdom, some understanding. Uh, the, 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 the concrete is still solid, but I'm still seeking you. You know how we seek? Come to church. Get in the body of believers. Come to Thursday night Bible study. I'm still seeking answers. Search the word. Search the scriptures. I'm still seeking. I don't see nothing moving. It don't matter what I don't see. I'm still seeking. And then guess what we do? After you did all the asking, all the seeking, it's time to start knocking. Lord, I'm still knocking. I'm still asking. It's persistence. Again, from what I can tell, there's no change here, right? Put a pin in that. There's no change in this, this hard concrete. It looks the same. The immovable objects in our lives still look the same. They're still heavy. They're still not going anywhere. But yet, I keep asking. I keep seeking. I keep knocking. I don't go by what it looks like. I go by what I know in the word. But sometimes we get caught, we step, get stuck at that thing. And we stop and we don't even bring up our hammer. We lay the hammer down. Ain't nothing happening. I promise you, if nothing's happening, then nothing's happening. But if I got my hammer and I got a song in my heart, I'm praising on Sunday morning, I'm still at work. I'm still persevering. I'm still believing, Lord. I believe you. I believe more in you than I believe in this object in front of me. See, that's the problem. We get stopped by the objects in front of us and not the one that created the object in the first place. When is it enough enough? We get so enamored by the thing that's blocking us and not the one that created it in the first place. How do, how, why don't you think that maybe that this, this, this piece of concrete, maybe God put that there? Or maybe he allowed it. Regardless, if he didn't want this piece of concrete in my life, he wouldn't be there. So we often look at these problems as curses, but no, they're actual blessings. If you have the right perspective and the right persona about it. But the widow kept knocking. She kept hammering. She kept, this is the judge. She, hey, judge, I'm coming back next week. I'm keep coming back. I don't even think she had a hammer, but she's, she had her knuckles. <laughs> she, by any means necessary, I'm going to get justice in this situation. Do you have that kind of persistence as a widow? And the thing about persistence is, <laughs> I was uh, doing some research. There is a, an ingredient for all successful people. There was a, a scientific, or a, um, uh, some academics did some research, and they were looking at the traits of successful people in our world. And they were looking, what are the qualities that make somebody successful and, and to make somebody more, achieve more than other people? And surprisingly, they said it wasn't, it wasn't the social skills, wasn't intelligence, whether it be emotional or intellectual. It wasn't um, not even genetics that made them so successful. It wasn't even their talent. You know what makes people stand out and become ultra, ultra successful? It's a term called grit. Anybody ever heard that term grit or moxie? Grit. Grit is one of those things that it says that no matter what, I'm going to get what I came for. No matter who's in front of me, no matter who's behind me, who's beside me, I'm going to get what I came for and I'm not going to stop. I got to have some grit in my life. If you want to get prayers answered in your life, you need perseverance and you need some grit. That no matter what happens to me or what happened around me, I'm still going to ask. Grit. Grit is one of those things that all people of greatness have. Um, I saw the story. They were talking about the uh, 2008 Olympic team. And this is a team by Kobe Bryant and some younger um, Carmelo Anthony's and LeBron James, some really great athletes, but, 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 but Kobe was the alpha of the alpha males in the room. And they were talking about this story that, that they went out, they were, they were prepping to get ready for the Olympics because for the previous two Olympic seasons, they had lost the gold medal. And that was unheard of in, the, in our country that our basketball team would not bring home the gold medal. And they were saying that they had kicked it that night, they were in Vegas, and, and all the guys was out drinking and doing what they do. And they came in at 5.30 in the morning and they're trying to talk about the night. And while they're in the lobby, here's Kobe Bryant with a sweat on saying, I'm about to go lift weights. 
He's already worked out at 530 in the morning. They're just coming in from the party. He's out working out. And you think about it, this is one of the greatest players of all time, has equal talent as anybody, but he's, he's demonstrating to them, I, I got grit, though. You came here to party. I came here to play. And it, and it dawned, I mean, at that level, these guys are so talented. If you watch them play, but the difference is what makes somebody good and great is grit. It's not talent. Kobe Bryant insatiably worked out. Again, he's, while they're out partying, he's working on his craft. He's looking at film. And then eventually, because of his grit, they said that by the end of the week, everybody was in the gym with him at 530 in the morning on his regiment, on his schedule. Because they were so impressed. They were learning, okay, how he does it. He's on something different. You see, he was demonstrating, look, look, young buck, I've done this for a while. And I understand you can jump out the gym and all that. But let me tell you, I got something you don't have in this grit. And when it's the fourth quarter and there's three seconds on the line and somebody needs the ball, I'm going to be the one to take the shot. Because I've been prepared for it. I dreamt about it. I thought about it. I trained for it. And it made all the difference. As Christians, we got to have grit. We can't, we can't be surpassed. we gotta, we got to pray more. That means you got to pray more and then pray more. And that means you got to go to church more and then go to church more. But have some grit to you to say, I'm not going to give up no matter what. I tell you, I've seen grit up close and personal too. The last 15 months, I've shared the journey with my dad. And, and the thing I, I, that my dad shows me grit is that it's, 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 it's so inspiring to see somebody who can't walk that tries to walk. My dad's walked his whole life, had this stroke, and he's debilitated on the one side. And to see him get up, he's 80 years old. It, it can't be too comfortable to try to, learn, to relearn to walk. And so many times he can say, you know what? I'm 80. I didn't walk as many walks as I want. You know, I'm going to walk my miles. I'm going to quit and I do my therapy. He doesn't do that. He gets up. He puts on the straps. He's, he gets the, the, the gate belts on. He gets people to stand him up. And he grunts and he moans. He's like, ugh, because it's painful. But he doesn't stop him. He takes a step. He takes another step, and they're watching him. But he's got grit. See, he didn't get grit when he was 80. He got grit when he was a little boy in eastern Kentucky. And he learned the value of grit and persevering and playing football and, and, and understanding that I didn't have a whole lot, but I'm going to get through it anyways. See, grit comes from a young age, and it carries his whole life. Because he could easily say, you know what, I'm not going to do it anymore. I'm done. I'm tired. This is too painful. I've never heard him say that yet. Because he's got grit. Whether he's 8 or 80, he's still got grit. And parents, let me talk to you for a second. We have a culture of parenting that I'm seeing that we don't like to see our kids fail. We, we, we will do it. We'll, we'll step in front of that thing before it happens because we don't want them to feel the pain of failure. It's the wrong thing to do, let me tell you. If you love your kids, you allow them to fail. And I'm not talking about they get hurt. I'm talking about you allow them to fail and try again because it's the grit that's going to make them successful in life. If mommy and daddy keep swooping in and, and takes care of everything and, 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 and they don't experience any adversity, they're going to be some limp, inefficient adults. Let me tell you. I heard this great quote. It says that, that if, I, if I raise my kids, I can spoil my grandkids. But if I spoil my kids, I got to raise these grandkids because they don't know no better. Grit. We misconstrue love for enablement. That's a difficult thing. When you enable somebody, again, I don't mind helping you. Helping you means here's a little something, something. Uh, do something, what are you going to do with this? But don't come back to me with the same something, something. That's love. I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you learn how to fish. But if I keep giving you a fish, you're not going to learn nothing. You're going to learn that Ken's got a lot of fishes. So parents, think on that. It's okay to fail because you're teaching them perseverance. Now encourage them to get back up, show them the way. Because one day they're going to get hit, smacked in the mouth, not figuratively. They're going to have some kind of pain point, And if they don't know how to deal with adversity, adversity will deal with them harshly. That's a tough thing to deal with, to have adversity and have no one to look around. Mama ain't here, daddy ain't here, uh, so-and-so's not here. And I got to figure it out myself and don't know how to fight. And you got to fight. Teach them early. Teach them moxie. Teach them grit. Teach them the value of, of that it's okay to fail because you're not a failure. We got people thinking that, that that makes you a failure. No, it's okay. Everybody fails. I don't know anybody that's successful that didn't have any failure stories. In fact, you're going to fail more than you are successful. That's the only way you become successful. If you got everything that you wanted every time that you wanted it, 
It's not success and it's ex expectation. And when you have, you can't appreciate it because you don't know how to, to maintain it. Perseverance. And let me say this too. Not everybody that participates in a sport deserves a trophy. I don't get this culture. This because you showed up, you get a trophy. No. That's like me just showing up to work and ain't doing no work and I get a paycheck. It don't work that way. We are putting our kids for failure, setting them up for failure. Doesn't, the life does not work that way. There's winners and there's losers sometimes. But even the people that lose the game doesn't make them a loser. If they keep coming back, keep working on their craft. That's how I learned in sports was you learn, you take your losses, and then I work on my craft to get better. It motivates you. Same thing in the kingdom of God. You want something from God and, and it seems like it's a closed door? You keep praying. You may have to modify your prayer, but you don't give up. We got too many Christians that come to church and something bad happened to them and they give up on God completely because somebody hurt them. Oh, them church people, that church pastor, he keeps asking for that money. I don't believe in church. What? That happens all the time. You take the incidents of one person and you, you label a whole culture and a whole group of people. Oh, they all bad. That's convenient. It's weak. And it sets you up for failure. So kids, we got some folks that are college bound or we be college bound. Let me tell you, a lot of people think going to college is about smarts and intelligence. It's not. No, these kids are no smarter than you. I know a lot of, <laughs> I know a lot of successful people with degrees that are idiots. And I say that lovingly. <laughs> because college, it is succeeding, whatever college or a job, it's, it's not necessarily about how smart you are, but it's the fact that you've got grit and you keep showing up. You might have got an F on paper, but the next time, hey, I'm going to get an A or a B. But I'm not going to let it break me, though. Keep going. Keep strapping up. Keep moving forward. Grit is, again, is a predictive to success. Not only in the things that you want, but also in life. And the next thing I want to talk about, so we talk about perseverance that you've got to have in this preparation for breakthrough. Let's talk about praise. I've talked about problem. I've talked about praying and patience, perseverance. Now let's talk about praise. Praise is a necessary component to getting your breakthrough. In verses 7 and 8, it says that, and, God, and will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry, cry out to him day and night? I take cry out to him to mean that praise him day and night. Will he keep putting them off that cry out to me day and night? I tell you, he will see that they get justice, and not only get justice, but they get it quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? So I want to talk about praise, but I also want to make a tie-in with justice. A lot of people don't think about praise and justice. Let me 